The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to HDSA's Caregiver's Corner webinar series. Today, we're going to hear from the physical and occupational therapy team from the HDSA Center of Excellence about University of Virginia about safety in the home. Laura Wilkinson, Shelley Newstep Watkins, and Erica Umbach and John Zanker work together at the HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Virginia. Although John is not with us today, he helped develop this presentation. Laura Wilkin, um, before I before I invite Laura, Shelley, and Erica to begin, I wanted to go over how to ask a question as well as how to answer this webinar, access this webinar after broadcast. Questions will all be answered after the presentation is concluded. However, you can send a question at at any time. To send a question, go to the control panel that appears on the right-hand side of your screen, type your question into the panel, and hit send. You'll also be able to access this webinar after broadcast um, in about a week. Um, you'll be able to download it off of the HDSA website. To download the presentation, go to www.hdsa.org and look for the frequently used shortcuts box on the right-hand side of the homepage and click on Caregiver's Corner. You'll be able to watch this presentation, download slides, as well as access older webinars. Um, finally, I want to ask everybody listening to please evaluate this webinar after broadcast by completing our brief survey. Your feedback helps us to continually improve our webinar offering. And now I'm pleased to, um, to introduce Lara, Shelley, and Erica. Lara received her MS in physical therapy from Boston University and her DPT from Shenandoah University. She currently works as an acute physical therapist at the University of Virginia Health System and has assisted with the HD clinic since 2010. Shelley Newstep Watkins, OTRL, received her MSOT from the University of St. Augustine in Florida and her BS in kinesthesiology from the College of William and Mary. She currently works on the neurology and neurosurgery acute units, as well as um, the HD clinic for UVA. Erica, finally, Erica Umbach completed her MS in occupational therapy from the University of South Dakota. She's worked in adult acute care at, at UVA since 2001, primarily with patients with neurological and neurosurgical diagnoses. She's also assisted um, with the HSA Center of Excellence since 2009. And last but not least, um, John Zanker who rece received her PT, his, P, his PT degree from Duke University in 1988. He's been working with neurology and neurosurgery patients at UVA since 1992 and has been the P -day, PT for UVA's, the Center of Excellence at UVA since it became a Center of Excellence in 2000 and has been and now I'm pleased to welcome our esteemed presenters. All right. Hi, everyone. We're so glad that you could all join us today. As Jane mentioned, we're going to be talking about safety in the home. My name is Laura Wilkinson, and I am a physical therapist. Um, this is a picture of me and my Christmas tree that I got this weekend. Um, all of the speakers today, as Jane mentioned, work at the University of Virginia Huntington's Disease Clinic, which is an HDSA Center of Excellence. And we work as part of a multidisciplinary team to provide care to people with Huntington's disease and their families. Uh, we're going to be reviewing quite a lot of information today, and we would encourage you to write down any questions as we go along or to utilize the, um, write them in the question box, as Jane also mentioned. Today we'll be discussing safety in the home. To start, I'm just going to provide an overview of Huntington's disease characteristics that place people with Huntington's disease at risk for falls or decreased safety in the home. We will also discuss general fall prevention, bathroom safety, bedroom safety, kitchen safety, and general household safety. As the caregiver for someone with Huntington's disease, you may agree that safety in the home is often a major concern. The different stages and progression of the disease can make planning and implementing safety measures difficult. And we hope that through this talk, we can give you some ideas of how to make this easier. 
The beginning and later stages of Huntington's disease are often when people are at the least risk for injury. Someone who is just starting out to show symptoms of Huntington's disease may not be at any more risk for injury than you or I, while someone who is in the later stages of HD may be at less risk of injury simply because they're less mobile. The greatest safety issues arise in the in-between stages, where people are dealing with a mixture of movement, thinking, and behavioral symptoms that combine to create significant safety risks. The three main problem areas, as I just mentioned, for people with Huntington's disease are movement, thinking, and behavior. These combine, or the combination of these three, combine to put someone with Huntington's disease at a higher risk for injury in the home. To start with, I'd like to review some of the most common movement problems seen with Huntington's disease. The first is uncontrolled excessive movement, or chorea. This is often the first and most obvious problem that we notice, but it does not cause as many issues as some of the other movement problems. For example, people with Huntington's disease have difficulty controlling the force of their movements. They might jump up from a chair suddenly or sit down hard and fast with little control. These quick and sudden movements can make them lose their balance or even weaken or break the furniture or toilet that they are sitting on. Next, people with Huntington's disease have trouble keeping their balance in sitting and standing. Once they lose their balance, they also have difficulty regaining it. Where you or I might just put out a hand to steady ourselves, people with Huntington's disease are often unable to make this quick decision and movement to prevent falls. You will also see that people with Huntington's disease have difficulty with their coordination and have a hard time starting a movement or task. This can sometimes seem like apathy on their part, but that, and that is a component of Huntington's disease, but there is also a decreased ability to physically start a movement. We will now discuss thinking problems. People with Huntington's disease have difficulty putting all the pieces together. You and I are able to make decisions about a lot of things quickly and at one time. However, people with Huntington's disease have difficulty knowing what to pay attention to, and they are easily distracted and have a hard time focusing and making good decisions. It is often hard for people with Huntington's disease to learn from their mistakes or learn new things. You and I might forget once that the oven ring is hot and burn our finger, but we learn and we will adjust what we are doing to avoid burning ourselves again. On the other hand, people with Huntington's disease may not make this connection or be able to change their behavior, and they might be at risk for burning themselves again. It is common for them to have trouble adjusting to new routines, situations, or activities, and have difficulty with multitasking. You may also find that they perseverate on things or persistently repeat a thought or task. And lastly, people with Huntington's disease have trouble with their memory and will often complain of slow thinking. The last problem that I'm going to review is behavioral problems. As a caregiver, you have probably encountered that your family or friend with Huntington's disease might display some of these characteristics. Irritability, impulsiveness, repeated behaviors, anxiety, apathy, depression, anger, and other dangerous behaviors. What we really want for you to take away from this review is that people with Huntington's disease will eventually have symptoms in all three of these areas, but how many of each characteristic will vary from person to person. No two people with Huntington's disease will ever present in the same way. It is often the thinking and the behavioral issues and not the movement issues that cause the most problems. This is because by not being able to make good decisions or problem solve, or problem solve People with Huntington's disease may put themselves in situations or environments that are unsafe, and they may not be able to figure out how to get out of it or how to change it to be safer. Next, we're going to look at general fall prevention. Why are people with Huntington's disease at risk for falling? Falls are often a combination of the problems that we just discussed, mobility, thinking, and behavioral. We often find that people with HD are not paying attention to their environment or what is going on around them. So, for example, they may not notice that while they are washing dishes, that water spilled on the floor. 
instead of wiping it up, they may leave it there, and it might put them at risk to slip and fall later. Similarly, falls can happen because they have poor safety awareness and have trouble knowing what is a safe situation or activity to be doing. They may show decreased judgment and have difficulty making good decisions about what they are about to do. For example, they may, people with HD may not realize that going up and down the stairs is harder and more dangerous than just walking. And they may try to go up and down the stairs without holding onto the rail or even trying to carry something up and down the stairs. Lastly, falls occur because people with Huntington's disease often have decreased balance and responses and they are unable to prevent themselves falling if they do lose their balance. So of course, how can we try and prevent someone with HD from falling? The most important thing that you can do is to try to determine if there is a pattern to their falls. We want you to look at four things. Where, when, how, and why are the falls occurring? Where do the falls occur? Was it in the bathroom? Was it outside the house? Or was it on the stairs? Then when are the falls occurring? Was it in the morning or the nighttime? Was it while they were using the bathroom or when they first stood up? Or was it even while they were asleep? Next, how do the falls occur? Did the person fall backwards or to the side? Did their knees buckle? Did they trip on something? Or did they maybe just lose their balance? And then lastly, why did the falls occur? Was it their poor judgment? Or was it the environment that they were in? Were they maybe wearing socks on a slippery floor? Or did they not hold onto the rails going up and down the stairs? Once you can recognize the pattern of their falls, it is so much easier to try and start making changes. Think about what you can do to make the house safer, provide them a consistent routine, or somehow change their activities to make them safer. One of the best preventative things you can do is establish good habits early on. This will help to minimize problems later. For example, a person with Huntington's disease may not have difficulty going up and down the stairs now, but if you start practicing to make sure they hold on to the rail no matter what, it will hopefully stick in the future. People with Huntington's disease often need more time to learn new habits, and therefore repetitive practice helps. If someone with HD starts to go up the stairs without holding onto the rail, stop them and make them start again holding onto the rail to make sure this good habit sticks. If the person's disease has progressed to a point where they're no longer able to make safe decisions, it comes down to the caretaker, you and I, to make sure that they have increased supervision to ensure that they do not do something that is unsafe and causes them to fall. So there are some easy changes that you can make to your house to decrease the risk of falls and injuries. First, remove those throw rugs. It's easy to trip or slide on those. We recommend that you keep pathways and hallways clear throughout the house, as this will make it easier for them to walk. Keep all areas of your home well lit so that they can see where they are going. And try to remove objects that can be easily knocked over, such as vases, glassware, or even light furniture objects that can easily break and possibly result in sharp edges. Some people find that it's helpful to pad the corners of furniture or the sharp edges that they constantly bump into to help prevent injury. We often have people avoid using unstable furniture or furniture that can easily fall over or break. And as I have already mentioned, stairs can sometimes be one of the more dangerous places in the home. When going up and down the stairs, they should always hold on to the rail. If the person with Huntington's disease has ongoing safety awareness and judgment problems, go ahead and block the stairs to prevent them going up and down and make sure that they have all they need on one floor to decrease the need of going up and down the stairs. Some of the other changes that you can make are the following. We always have recommend that people with HD wear supportive shoes or go barefoot. We want them to avoid walking in socks or shoes such as flip-flops as these can easily make them slide or lose their balance. There may come a time when using an assistive device to help with walking might be necessary, or that they may require constant supervision when they are moving around. If the person enjoys being outside or walking outdoors, but they have a history of falls, we often recommend that they try to avoid walking on uneven ground that can challenge their balance and increase their risk of falls. 
If the person with Huntington's disease is already falling frequently, some people will consider having them wear a helmet to protect their head or elbow and knee, knee pads to decrease injuries. It is so important to try and involve the person with Huntington's disease actively in protecting themselves. Some of the ways that you can do this is to post safety reminders around the house to help them remember. Try to make tasks as simple as possible. It's often good to realize that fatigue is often a complaint for people with Huntington's disease. So allow them to take frequent rest breaks or place chairs with high backs and armrests around the house for them to sit in and rest. Using checklists and timers can help people with Huntington's disease stay on a good schedule and keep track of what they need to do. Remember that we mentioned the thinking and behavioral problems are what create their decreased safety and put them at risk for falls. The final topic that I'm going to review is some of the equipment that we recommend to our, our people with Huntington's disease. Using some of this equipment can help increase their safety and decrease their risk of falling. A rollator, as pictured here in this slide, can be very useful to increase safety while walking. The four wheels move easily and the built-in seat allows them to sit whenever they are tired. As walking becomes more difficult, it may be time to consider a wheelchair. We usually recommend a Hemi Height wheelchair. This is a wheelchair that is lower to the ground and allows someone to easily use their legs to propel the wheelchair. This allows for them to keep some independence in getting around. We also recommend that the wheelchair have an anti-tip bar to prevent the wheelchair rocking backwards and hill holders to prevent the wheelchair rolling back on an incline. Some other equipment that you can consider are adding weight to their walker or rollator to decrease the risk of it tipping and provide more stability. Some people find that using a cane is just enough to help keep their balance. We always recommend having someone use the rail on the stairs, but sometimes installing a rail on the walls in your home can help as well. Lastly, people with Huntington's disease often find that a recliner to sit in can feel supportive and allow them to be better positioned than in a regular straight back chair. Shelley is now going to talk to you all about safety in the bathroom bedroom and when doing housework. Hi, I'm Shelley, an occupational therapist at UVA's HD clinic. And this is a picture of me on a run near the monuments in DC. Now we're going to discuss specific safety suggestions around the home and during certain everyday tasks. We're going to start by addressing bathroom safety, including safety during toileting, bathing, and while doing tasks at the sink. Because people with Huntington's disease often have difficulty with uncontrolled movement and difficulty controlling force, they often flop down onto the toilet. This can be uncomfortable and cause the bolts in the toilet to loosen. So you should regularly tighten all hardware on the toilet. You can consider replacing the standard hard toilet seat with a padded soft toilet seat to make this more comfortable too. Another good habit is to encourage anyone with unsteadiness to always reach back for the toilet seat when sitting down to improve their steadiness. We often hear about people with Huntington's disease falling because they were rushing to the bathroom. A toileting schedule is a plan to use the bathroom at regular intervals, such as every two hours. This can prevent the feeling of needing to rush to the bathroom and can in turn prevent falls and possible injury. This slide provides suggestions on equipment that can make toileting easier. When, and when a task is easier, it is also generally safer. Placing grab bars around the toilet gives someone with decreased balance something sturdy to hold on to. Increasing the height of the toilet makes getting on and off the toilet less challenging especially for someone who has difficulty keeping their balance and controlling the amount of force in their movement. To increase the height of a regular toilet, you can install a raised toilet seat, which is a thick plastic ring that fastens to the toilet, or you can place a bedside commode without the bucket over the toilet. You can replace your regular toilet with a handicap toilet, a handicap height toilet also. If getting to the bathroom is difficult, then using a bedside commode, as shown in this slide, in the bedroom or a urinal can be safer options. 
One of the most challenging tasks for someone with impaired balance is taking a shower or bath because soap, water, and a slick floor can definitely increase the chance of a fall. One of the first things that can be done to prevent falls is place no slip stickers or a mat on the floor of the tub or shower. Also, to pre prevent falls from picking up dropped soap, use soap on a rope, a bath mitt, or a bath sponge that can be looped around the wrist. To prevent falls from trying to reach something outside the shower or having to get in and out of the shower multiple times to get things, always try to have everything needed for bathing in an easy to reach place before starting bathing. If remembering these helpful hints is also a challenge, post a reminder list in your bathroom. Equipment that can improve safety during bathing includes grab bars, an adjustable height sh shower head, and a tub or shower seat. When these suggestions are not enough to prevent falls, then the person with Huntington's disease needs to have supervision during bathing. Additionally, adjusting the water temperature on your water heater can ensure that the water coming out of the faucet cannot burn anyone, even if only the hot water gets turned on. This is especially important for anyone who may have difficulty managing or adjusting the knob. It is not uncommon for us to see a person with Huntington's disease who avoids hygiene tasks because these tasks can be difficult and uncomfortable, especially when dealing with uncontrolled movements and decreased control of force. For increased control during hygiene tasks, a person with Huntington's disease can do the task from sitting down or prop his arm on a counter or wall to increase control and stability. If spitting out the toothpaste is difficult, try using mouthwash as an alternative. Also, an electric shaver is a much safer option than a standard razor with blades. Avoid using glass bottles to hold frequently used products in order to avoid safety concerns related to broken glass. Lastly, as mentioned before, keep frequently used items in an easy to reach location to avoid extra or unnecessary reaching or bending. Now we're moving out of the bathroom and into the bedroom. Falls in the bedroom often occur while getting in and out of bed, during sleeping, or while dressing. To minimize the chance of someone with Huntington's disease falling while trying to get out of bed alone, use a bed alarm and or a baby monitor to alert you, the caregiver. You can get a bed alarm, which can be used as a chair alarm also, from many medical websites. To minimize the chance of someone with Huntington's disease falling out of bed while sleeping, you can place rolled towels or blankets under the fitted sheet to create a bumper, purchase bed bolsters, or place foam wedges under the edge of the mattress. To minimize the chance of someone with Huntington's disease from getting hurt from falling out of bed while sleeping, you can make sure that there is nothing sharp, like the corner of a bedside table near the bed. Place the mattress on the floor to decrease the distance of the fall, or place an exor exercise mat on the floor next to the bed. Please avoid using blankets on the floor for cushioning since these often become a tripping hazard. Avoid using full side rails in effort to prevent falls from the bed. Full side rails often are another hard obstacle to bump into or go over. You may want to place the bed next to a wall to minimize falls from the bed. But if you do this, then you should also consider padding the wall. It's easy to get distracted and fall while thinking about getting dressed, especially if someone with decreased balance is trying to dress themselves from standing. Instead, consistently remind him or her to collect all clothes and then sit down to get dressed. Speaking of clothing, doing laundry is another task that can be adjusted to be easier and safer. Anyone who has difficulty with balance should never carry a laundry basket up and down stairs. Instead, use a bag with a shoulder strap so the hands are available to hold the rails when going upstairs, and then just push the bag down the stairs to get it down. 
Of course, another alternative is to just leave the laundry bag at the bottom of the steps until someone else can carry it up. When folding laundry, do it from sitting down. As mentioned previously, store items such as your clothing in easy to reach places, so not the top shelf of the closet. Anyone with difficulty controlling their movements should avoid ironing because of the chance of burning themselves or causing a fire. Instead, try to buy wrinkle resistant clothes or use the fluff setting on the dryer if wrinkles are a concern. Next, Erica, another occupational therapist at our Huntington's Disease Clinic, will discuss safety related to the kitchen, childcare, medication, guns, smoking, and driving. Hi, I'm Erica. Now for the next room in the house, the kitchen. The kitchen has the potential to be one of the most, if not the most, dangerous rooms in the house. With so many dangers to be aware of, something in and of itself that is difficult for most folks with Huntington's to do, eliminating dangers in advance can help put your mind more at ease as a caregiver. Here are some recommendations to make the kitchen a safer place. Number one, change from glassware to plastic cups and plates. This is a recommendation we make for nearly all our patients with Huntington's disease. Number two, consider if it is time for your family member to stay away from sharp knives. Korea and poor safety awareness and judgment can make this particularly concerning. Alternatives to knives that exist are veggie choppers, food processors, and my personal two favorites, kitchen shears and pre-cut food. By the way, the pre-cut food is often offered as an option at restaurants. Just ask. Recommendation number three, use insulated cups with lids and handles. This helps eliminate spills and potential burns. Number four, as mentioned earlier, be careful with potentially unstable furniture. Don't sit on rolling chairs and be careful with high stools. And number five, keep frequently used items at an easy access level. Retrieving things from low, high, or crowded cupboards increases the risk for falls and injuries. If you're frequently noticing arm burns or pans with burnt food as a common theme in your kitchen, consider the following. Use timers, preferably ones that continue to alarm if not attended to, rather than those that ring only once. Use long oven mitts, the kind that covers the entire forearm. Use the microwave or toaster oven instead of the oven or stove. And don't leave the kitchen while cooking. This point cannot be emphasized enough. Earlier, Laura mentioned how easily distractible people with Huntington's disease can be. Focus on one thing at a time. If all else fails, more extreme safety measures can be taken, such as unplugging the stove altogether, removing knobs, dials, and controls on the stove, or installing sensors that alarm and or turn off the stove if it is left unattended. More information on sensors is provided in the web resource list at the end of this presentation. In a nutshell, however, those sensors attract your attention to an unattended stove with flashing lights and an audible alert. If the stove continues to be unattended despite those alarms, the sensor will disconnect power to the stove. As a side note, the sensor is a pre-installed feature on some newer stove models. For someone with Huntington's, who is still cooking, keeping track of what ingredients have been added or what steps have been done can become challenging. This slide shows an example of one strategy to address this. 
Well, for you and me, making oatmeal seems relatively simple. It may feel complicated to someone with Huntington's. Using photocopied recipes can help. These can serve as a step-by-step -step checklist. Ingredients and preparation steps can be checked off as they are completed. This helps keep the focus on doing just one thing at a time. The following are good guidelines for everybody. Keep poisonous substances and cleaning supplies locked up and labeled. Fire extinguishers should be nearby and properly maintained. Smoke detectors should also be nearby with fully charged batteries. Finally, emergency phone numbers, especially 911 and the local poison control center number, should be kept by each phone. Remember, folks with Huntington's disease need all the extra safety cues they can get. It takes them longer to process things, and they are generally less aware of hazards. As an example, we have posed the following question to many patients at UVA's Huntington's Clinic. Let's say you're cooking and the frying pan catches on fire. What do you do? A typical response we get is, call my wife or call my husband. So again, remember, folks with Huntington's need all the extra safety cues they can get. Prevention is key. Our next topic is child care. How long a parent with Huntington's disease is able to care for a baby or young child varies from person to person. The following are some common things we address with parents at our clinic. First off, an adult who requires supervision due to HD symptoms is not an appropriate unsupervised caregiver for children of any age. The same symptoms and problems we've referenced earlier, such as having a limited attention span, poor safety awareness and judgment, difficulties with memory, and a tendency toward dangerous behaviors apply more than ever when children's well-being is at stake. Individuals with Huntington should not carry babies while going up or down stairs. Even when simply walking, the child can distract one's attention or throw one's balance off enough to put both individuals at risk. As an alternative to carrying the child, put them in a stroller to keep them safe. When changing diapers, don't use a changing table. Babies can accidentally fall or roll off the changing table. Instead, put the changing pad on the floor or on the middle of a bed. If a baby is still being bottle fed, use a bottle warmer to avoid overheating the milk. This warms the bottle to a preset safe temperature. If you think about it, many, if not all, of the things that can be done to make homes safer for children also apply to people with HD. That being said, there are many, many ways to keep a parent with HD active and involved in their children's lives in a safe manner. Just as with the elderly population, Driving can be a touchy subject for those with Huntington's, as it is often equated with independence. Individuals with Huntington's cannot usually self-monitor when they need to stop driving. Family members often don't like to be the bad guy, but also want their loved ones to be safe. If there is any question about whether or not someone with Huntington's should be driving, they probably shouldn't be. For an impartial, objective evaluation, find a driving assessment program. We've included two websites by which to do this. These assessments are not part of the DMV and involve testing to assess the areas required for safe driving. Thinking, what health, givers, 
what healthcare providers refer to as cognition, vision, and physical ability. Reaction time is tested. This is required to ensure a driver can stop quickly enough to avoid rear-ending another driver. Decision-making and planning skills are also tested. These are skills required for tasks, such as making a left-hand turn or passing a car on the highway. Other skills are also tested. Aside from the driver rehabilitation assessment, here are some other strategies for safe driving. Regularly have a family member ride along to assess safety when the person with Huntington's is driving. This is a very frequent recommendation we make at our clinic. As mentioned earlier, Distractions should be avoided. Examples include listening to music, changing radio channels, changing CDs, adjusting control, such as music volume or temperature control, talking on a cell phone, shaving, applying makeup, or smoking. Remember, multitasking is difficult for individuals with Huntington's and should be, should be avoided in order to prevent accidents. Park in the emptiest parts of parking lots. This helps to eliminate the need to gauge distances from other cars when maneuvering to park and also decreases distractions caused by other traffic. Leave a buffer zone or extra space around the car, both when driving and parking. As I mentioned earlier, reaction time can be affected with Huntington's and buffer zone strategy helps prevent accidents. Rely upon a GPS, but only if it's something the driver is used to and they don't find distracting. Remember, different things are distracting to different people. Finally, stick to familiar routes and drive during less busy times of the day. Driving is a complex skill. Symptoms caused by Huntington's disease often compromise the ability to drive safely. Don't wait until a crisis occurs to address driving. And be sure to watch for an upcoming webinar on this website on driving. Now it's time to talk about managing medications. While some individuals with Huntington's are able to manage their own meds successfully, it is a challenging task for others. Good organizational skills and memory are required in order to be successful. For those that have trouble, there are a few strategies that can help. Use a pill box to organize medications. This can help to decrease missed doses as well as preventing overdoses. It is important to know whether or not missing or adding a dose of specific medications can cause problems, as well as knowing what those problems would be. Another strategy, use an alarm reminder if missing medications is a problem. Some pill boxes come with alarms. These are more expensive, however. Some patients find that keeping a separate timer beside their meds works just as well. Writing the date that the pills should be finished on the bottle can be helpful, as well as writing on the calendar when the next supply should be ordered. These two strategies help compensate for reduced organizational skills. Some families find that if they manage the medication and set out only one day's worth, or even one dose's worth, of medications at a time, this greatly reduces the risk for medication errors. If there is still concern after some or all of the above strategies are implemented, it is safest to keep medications locked up and to make sure you or another caregiver is administering them. The next slide covers two topics. I'll give everybody a minute while the obvious smoking gun jokes run through your head. 
Firearms pose obvious safety risks. Guns should either be locked up in a gun safe or removed from the house. If put in a gun safe, the key should be kept in a place where the individual with Huntington does not have access to it. In terms of hunting, a good principle to follow is to never hunt alone. Tree stands should be avoided. Here at UVA, we see our share of patients without Huntington's disease with injuries from falling out of tree stands every year. So you can only imagine that individuals with HD are at an even higher risk for injuries. While some individuals with Huntington's do just fine with hunting, others are an accident waiting to happen. Remember, no two individuals are exactly alike. When it comes to smoking, the obvious advice we give is to quit. If, however, that isn't an option, here are some guidelines for optimizing safety with cigarettes. Only smoke outside in a designated area. Keep the area leaf and trash free to minimize the risk for ashes sparking fires. In addition, keep an ashtray nearby and do not multitask while smoking. In fact, make sure that only one cigarette is lit at a time. Sit down to smoke and finish smoking before leaving the area. As with other recommendations we've made, it is a good idea to instill this habit prior to when your loved one is exhibiting dangerous behaviors. If Korea makes holding on to a cigarette difficult and dropping them is common, consider using a smoker's robot. This is the item pictured to the right. It holds the cigarette for you. You place the black mouthpiece in your lips instead of the cigarette. No risk for dropping the cigarette this way. These were recently priced between $50 and $80 from various online vendors. A smoker's apron is another option for smokers with the dropsies. These are flame retardant aprons which eliminate all those cigarette holes and clothes from fallen ashes. And finally, keep a charged fire extinguisher nearby, just in case. Many caregivers worry over whether or not they are providing enough supervision. Here are some suggestions for ways to increase supervision of your loved one. Home cameras used with smartphone apps, webcams, and home security systems provide camera monitoring when you are away from home or in other parts of the house. In this same manner, baby monitors can be used so long as you are both inside the house or the yard. If your loved one is not safe to get up without assistance, stair alarms can be used on chairs or beds to alert you if the person is trying to get up on their own. Some allow simple warning messages to be recorded and play if activated. For example, you might record, Johnny, sit back down. You need to wait until I can get help for you to get up. I'll be right there. Many people rely on neighbors, family, or friends checking in throughout the day. Planning a schedule for this works best so that multiple times of the day and week are covered. While many caregivers prefer that someone lays eyes on things to make sure all is well at home, frequent phone calls can be an option too whether to or from the person with HD. Community programs are sometimes available, such as adult daycare centers or senior centers. These may or may not be appropriate for individuals with Huntington's, however, depending on their particular behaviors. A service such as Lifeline can be a useful tool. Multiple companies offer similar services. Most are connected to a phone system and are available as bracelets or necklaces to be worn. 
They connect with the individual over a loudspeaker in the home or call a pre-selected family member, prompting them to check on their loved one. These services have either a fee up front or a monthly fee. They all, of course, depend upon the person with Huntington's to realize that something is wrong and activate the system. GPS personal tracking devices offer another potential way to monitor someone. Though frequently targeted toward individuals with dementia, a GPS would, be, would often be appropriate for individuals with Huntington's as well. Devices allow users to call for assistance and allow designated caregivers to locate the user's position, usually within 5 to 10 meters. These devices often incorporate one or two-way voice communication, which is activated by the simple push of a button. At least one company exists that sells shoes with built-in GPS tracking devices. These shoes, while pricey at $300 a pair, offer another potential way to monitor someone's location. Of course, they don't monitor what the individual is doing, which can be a bigger problem. Each individual with Huntington's disease is unique in their needs. Work together with your team to determine the best approach. So, when is it time to get additional help? You know it's time if, I feel like I'm just box worthy right now. Anyway, you know it's time to get extra help if the person you care for with Huntington's is having falls, experiencing frequent injuries, getting burned, suffering accidents, and having a lot of close calls. That's when you should consider getting additional help. If you, as a caregiver, are feeling overwhelmed and you're worried each time you leave the house, consider getting extra help. Do you wonder daily, what's going to happen today while I'm at work, while I'm out shopping, when I take the trash out, while I mow the yard, is Johnny going to burn the house down today? That's when it's time for your loved one's safety and for your peace of mind to consider getting extra caregiver help. If you are the caregiver and you're worried, listen to your instincts. The next question we'll address is, what kind of extra help is available? Ideally, every family dealing with Huntington's needs to be in contact with a social worker at an HD Center of Excellence. They can help identify resources that are local to you you can find the social worker nearest you by calling the Huntington's Disease Society of America at 1-800-345-HDSA or 4372. 1-800-345-4372. Some of you may be wondering, what is a center of excellence? According to HDSA's website, centers of excellence are stable regional centers providing high-quality clinical care and services to individuals affected by HD and their families. In addition to clinical and family services, they provide professional and lay education and are involved in HD clinical research. Centers of excellence are designed to provide comprehensive multidisciplinary diagnostic and therapeutic services for HD individuals and their families. Services are centered around an organized HD clinic in which an individual's needs are determined. Plans are made to fulfill those needs and sufficient follow-up is provided. Now, back to the list of what extra help is available. Home health occupational therapists and physical therapists can be invaluable resources. They can see what's actually going on in your home, what your specific home setup is, and work with you to make your home as safe as possible. One thing to be aware of is that not every occupational or physical therapist is familiar with Huntington's disease. 
It's not as common as arthritis or Parkinson's disease, for example. When we recommend home health or outpatient therapy, we always encourage local therapists to communicate with us as we can offer expert advice on therapy matters specific to Huntington. We're happy to collaborate in order to help. Another way to get more help in the home is by hiring aides or sitters. Most often this is paid out of pocket. Your social worker can help facilitate this if you need help. Lastly, adult daycare centers may be available in your area. Finally, the next few slides provide some examples of companies that sell equipment we have referenced in this webinar. Know that this list is only intended to serve as a starting list. There is no intention to promote or recommend these specific companies over other vendors. Remember that individuals' equipment needs vary from one person to the next. Work with your local professionals to determine what items are appropriate for you. Thank you for tuning into this webinar on home safety. We hope we've given you some helpful information and recommendations. Now, we welcome any questions that you have. Give us one second while we just try to pull everything back up. Thank you, and as a reminder for people, to ask a question, you go to the question tab on, on the right-hand side of your screen, type it in, and hit back. So I'm just going to read the first question that's up there, and we'll see what we can answer for you guys. Um, the first question is, is there a dignified solution to headgear? Helmets are so bulky for everyday wear, padded hats maybe. Um, that is a, a tricky section, I would think. Um, do you know? There's a new company called Plum. Yeah, we do it. There's a new company called Plum Enterprises that has a padded helmet that does not look like the football helmets or the soccer helmets. It still looks like a helmet, but it's a little bit less obtrusive than some of the helmets that we've used in the past. Okay. Carol Clerico uh, joined us. She's uh, another OT who works at UVA who used to be the uh, primary OT covering clinic. So thank you, Carol. Okay. Um, the next question is, how do you encourage HD patients to hold the stair rail without nagging? Uh, that's a good question, and I'm sure it does come across as nagging. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, if they're trying to set good habits, you're trying to remind them. Um, in hopes that they will, you know, formulate and do it on their own. Um, maybe just trying to, when, as they first go to the stairs, you know, or we're going to go upstairs now, remember to hold on to the rail. And then as they're going, um, if they forget again, you know, remind them again. Um, if it comes across as nagging, unfortunately, we just want them to be safe. So and sometimes nagging is what helps to get the, that good habit to stick. And sometimes if, um, the professionals you're working with, like the home therapist, if that information comes from them, it, it's sometimes better received by the person with Huntington. Sometimes. Okay. Moving on to the next question. What's the best way to approach a man about the topic of sitting to urinate? If this is a, a difficult conversation for you to have with your loved one, then this is something that can definitely be addressed by um, the therapist at an HD clinic or your home health therapist. Um, when, as an OT at the clinic, when we're discussing this in our sessions, a lot of times what I like to emphasize to the patient, uh, who's a gentleman who is not interested in sitting to urinate, is talking about um, all the benefits, especially increased independence. If if he's willing to sit down and therefore be safer, then you don't have to be quite so close. Um, and in his personal space. So that's one benefit to emphasize. The other one, of course, is safety because of the, uh, unsteadiness. Um, during standing, sometimes um, urine can get on the floor or other, other safety concerns. So two things to really emphasize um, if you're discussing this with your loved one is 
increase independence and increase safety by choosing this new way um, to toilet. I was just going to go back a second just to the, the stair question of nagging and just something that came across to me was that if, if you're not there, maybe just putting up a sign at the end of the stairs as well saying to remind to hold on to the stairs. Or even maybe, um, you know, if it's appropriate in your house to put some kind of colored tape on the handrail to give them a visual cue that maybe they should hold on to that, that might be another way to kind of remind them to use it without having to nag them as well. And another thing that sometimes works is to um, lead by example. So if in your household it's safe for everyone to hold on to the stairwell when you go up and down the stairs, it can be a habit that you can encourage for the entire family. So not only is the person being asked to hold on, but everyone in the family is being asked to hold on because that's the safe way to go up and down the stairs. All right, the next question we've got is, uh, any suggestions regarding winter clothing? When getting going for a daily walk outside, this patient refuses to wear long pants or a coat, preferring shorts and a t-shirt. Do we have any recommendations to ease him into wearing appropriate winter clothing? Well, I, I think that what you're seeing um, a lot in this, this question is the judgment issues. So it can be very difficult to reason um, with someone with Huntington's disease that's having this type of um, symptom where it, they're having a difficulty with insight and, and judgment. So sometimes the things that you may think of as a caregiver that makes complete sense to you and you can't understand why they're not seeing it your way, you're, you're going against this um, symptom of Huntington's disease. One way to try to help manage the situation is perhaps encourage your loved one to select clothing themselves. So maybe a bulky coat isn't desirable, but maybe they're more willing to put on um, long sleeve, um, like fleece or long underwear or that stretchy Under Armour type thing. So maybe providing other options um, something on the totally other end of the spectrum would be um, to pack away the summer clothes in the attic and just have winter clothes available. The next um, question we get is define extra help. Hopefully that was asked before um, I went to the slide after extra help where I explained what kind of extra help is available. Um, if the person who sent that question in can just write in again and let me know if I answered that already, that would be helpful. Uh, and we'll come back to it if we need to. The next question um, we received is about um, a 15-year-old student with HD in a school setting. I think that's one that's very specific, so perhaps we can um, talk to you individually and provide our contact information and provide you some specific support. So we'll um, try to make sure to get you that information. And then the last question is, um, what are the recommended flooring surface, surfaces for bathrooms, kitchens, bedrooms, um, for example, like cork versus rubber? Um, I don't know if we have any specific recommendations for that. Um, obviously, those kind of the cork and rubber floors are definitely going to be a little bit softer um, in terms of falls, um, but we also understand that kind of refurbishing your home to, to do that can be a pricey endeavor and may not be something that fits for everybody. Um, so hopefully it, with our recommendation today, trying to make it a little bit um, other options for making the home safer to hopefully prevent falls. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other flooring recommendations. Like we said, we don't really want to put um, throw rugs down because that, those are easy to trip on. Um, things like that. Going back to the um, define extra help question, just in case there's still questions about what that was, I'll kind of just gloss over the, the things I listed. Um, home health, occupational therapy, and physical therapy, and tired aides or sitters. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Got word that it's been addressed. I'm glad. Thank you so much. Go ahead, James. I'm afraid that we are out of time for today, but if anyone has any other questions for us.
for Lara, Erica, or Shelley, you can call HDSA at 800-345-4372, um, or you can also email them to me, Jane Kogan, at jkogan at hdsa.org, and I will put you in touch with them. Um, thank you so much um, to, um, to all of you for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.